a couple of months, several months, and uh, we are, let me just tell you a little bit about the program tonight. Of course, usually we have our uh, youth day on a Saturday all day. We've ex this first year we've expanded it to Friday night and then Sunday morning. Uh, we're very happy that Joe Wells could work us in. Uh, he lives in Tennessee. Uh, he works for Fried Harbin a little bit, and he has Kyo Publications, a lot of good stuff here. He brought the displays with him, and so check that out in between services. But tonight, uh, Joe is going to present a lesson, and then uh, we already have some questions from online that have been submitted, and so he's going to deal with some of those questions about present culture and things of that nature, some of the things that our young people especially are facing that guys my age and older and even a little bit younger wouldn't have even thought about when, when I was young. But it's all over the place now, and so we have to deal with it uh, from a biblical perspective, and Joe is just a man for that. And so if you do have a question, please write it down. Uh, there's a pen and there's a card and a few in front of you. Write those down, and uh, we'll get them, and we can uh, deal with those questions as well. And so he'll present the lesson, and then we'll have a little question and answer up here. So we're just very glad you're here, and uh, we look forward to it, and uh, Brother Joe Wells. Good evening. All right, let's try that again. Good evening. good evening. I won't sleep if you don't. Sound good? All right, that's going to be our deal. If I start seeing you sleeping, that's it. I'm done. You're like, oh, we can get out of this sermon real quick, right? Just by going to sleep. No, you can't, because I'm going to ask you to love the person beside you, and I've done this at youth rallies uh, for years, okay? If you notice the person beside you starting to nod off, I'm going to ask you to love them enough to reach over behind their arm. You know that fatty part of the arm right there? I'm going to ask you to love them enough to reach over and pinch the fire out of that part of their fatty part of their arm, okay? Don't do it now. They're not asleep yet. They're not asleep yet. And some of you are like, let's just move away from everybody right now, right? So I have fun doing what I do. Uh, this weekend, I intend to have fun. I intend to, to enjoy studying God's Word. Uh, I enjoy looking at culture. Uh, and I don't enjoy it just because, I, you know, sometimes people like to complain, uh, sometimes I like to complain. You can ask my family. Uh, you know, I may complain about a lot of things that are insignificant. Uh, however, when you and I talk about culture, we need to understand something. That when we deal with people who are dealing with real issues, that we're dealing with souls whom Jesus died for. You understand me when I start to say this? Right out of the gate, I need you young people to hear this. I need you to understand that this is not about personal issues. This is not about the concept of unloving, right? It is an understanding that everything we talk about, that it's tied to people who have backgrounds and they have feelings and sometimes people maybe have been abused in their backgrounds. Sometimes they come from different backgrounds than we come from. And so there's value in trying to understand, uh, not just complain, right? Anybody can complain, Right? Have you ever heard somebody complain before? Chances are you complained about something today. Well, not you. I mean, like you, figuratively you. You're perfect. You never complain, right? But sometimes young people complain. It's too hot. It's too cold. I didn't get the food that I want. My hair's not working the way it's supposed to work. I don't even know what that complaint is, but it's neat when I hear people say that. My complaint is I can't grow it very well on top, so I have kind of the dome showing, and that's why I cut it down so short. But either way, oftentimes we find ourselves getting wrapped up in this, and I don't want this weekend to be a concept of looking at current culture just from a, well, let's get together and complain about it. That's not what it is. Because at the end of the day, your goal and my goal is that we would have a closer walk with the Lord. You see, the truth of the matter is this, that you can't apply these lessons to people who aren't here. So therefore, I understand that as a speaker, my job is to know my audience. And my audience is, I firmly believe, they're here for a couple reasons. Number one, you just really wanted pizza tonight and your parents weren't cooking pizza and you're like, Mr. Brian's going to have pizza, we're going to go there and get pizza. I doubt any of you came here for the pizza, although thank you, it was very good, guys. Thank you all for that. You might have shown up tonight because you're like, Man, this guy, he is a big man and a bald man and a beautiful man, and I just can't wait to look at him for however many lessons. And I'm going to say probably not. I mean, you, thank you for amen in that one. You know, I will tell you when it's appropriate to amen. That's not one of those times, okay? I'll give you one of these when it's time to amen, okay? 
You know, that's why preachers do that, or they slap the podium. They've already worked it out in the audience. I know, don't, come on now, we're not going to hide it. We've already worked it out in the audience. It's time to amen. How do I know? Amen. See, y'all got it just right. But we're not here to, you didn't come here for that. You came here because you wanted to grow in your walk with the Lord. And chances are, you know individuals in your life that maybe are even dealing with some of these issues, and maybe you're dealing with some of the things that we're going to talk about. I want you to know this, that everything that we're going to look at this weekend, all the questions we're going to talk about tonight after um, my brief, of course my kids laugh when I say that, brief lesson, um, that this is all about helping individuals walk closer with the Lord. So as we begin, I wanted to say that right out of the gate, because as you look at this particular lesson tonight, I will tell you something, that, that you and I live in times where individuals really do need hope. We live in times where individuals, it's been described, our culture, much like a, a person who has set adrift, uh, that they have no direction because they don't know where they're going. And not only do they not know where they're going, they're catching any wind that blows along to take them there. Uh, I thought it was interesting. It was actually uh, one of the tutors, one of the, the counselors to Emperor Nero, who would talk about a ship that is set a sail but it doesn't know what port that it is heading towards. And basically that comment was something along these lines. If you don't know what port you're heading for, then any wind that comes along will get you where you're supposed to go. And I want you just to think about that for a moment. You and I, as children of God, as young people who are trying to be what God would have us to be, we're not perfect. We're made perfect by the blood of Jesus, but we still struggle the idea is this, though. We want to set our sights on heaven. We want to set our sights on eternity, right? And if that be the case, then we don't want to catch every wind that comes along and blows in this direction or that direction. I think it's quite interesting that the Bible will say that we're no longer supposed to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine or trickery that comes about through the thoughts of mankind that there's supposed to be a growing up. Well, here's the deal. Many individuals who profess to be Christians today are spiritually stunted, spiritually stunted, because their concepts of what it means to be spiritual are not rooted in God. They're rooted in themselves. They're rooted in their feelings. Maybe they're rooted in modern uh, thought. And so at the end of the day, it really is this concept where individuals are floating. The problem is, as you and I look at our surroundings, and you look here, it wasn't, you know, last night we drove through Atlanta. I don't know when the last time you had the privilege of driving through Atlanta, Georgia was. I can tell you this, late at night, we've driven in, in Atlanta after midnight, it's still filled with people on the interstates. I could only imagine what it would be like to get off and go to the varsity on a Friday night in Atlanta, Georgia. But the idea is this, you go through a city like Atlanta, you go through a city like Orlando, and what you're going to realize is this, there are a lot of people in this world, there are a lot of people in this area, and not all of them know where they're going. Some of them haven't given two thoughts of where they're going beyond today. It's almost as if they've decided that the most important thing in their life is what's going to happen today, or perhaps tomorrow. And if it's a young person, most of them don't think beyond this weekend or this date with this person. Not a lot of people are thinking, I wonder where I'm going to spend eternity. So young people, adults, that's what I want you to, I guess, kind of contemplate in this, this weekend lessons uh, uh, series on, on learn to discern. Because the idea behind discernment is that that you think about in the days where, where Joseph was a slave in Egypt and he would have a dream and, and, and he would interpret rather, he would interpret Pharaoh's dream and he would tell him there's going to be seven years of plenty uh, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so that you have food during the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh said, where are we going to find someone so wise and discerning? Where are we going to find someone who can, can be over something like this? And, and what I want you to understand is this, that Joseph's wisdom... And Joseph's discernment didn't come from himself. It came from God. God is the one that revealed that to him. 
And while God is not going to audibly whisper to you or, or verbally proclaim something to you, the, the Bible makes it very clear. You and I have the Word of God today. That's not how He speaks to us today. But the idea is this, that, that He has revealed to us the wisdom that He would have us to understand. And, and He says, I want you to discern. I want you to be able to judge between the wide path and the narrow path. I want you to be able to discern between good fruit and bad fruit. Uh, I want you to be able to discern between uh, the rock that you're going to build your house on and the sand that's going to go splat when the rain come, fum, you know, come tumbling down or whatever the song is. I can't remember off the top of my head. But the idea is this. At the end of the day, not everybody's thinking of those things. But I can tell you this. Everybody in our culture is thinking of some things. What you see before you here is, is something that is consistent in the lives of everyone whom you will come across. It doesn't matter if they're a Christian or they're an atheist. It doesn't matter if they're a Muslim or if they're a Hindu. Uh, It really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, there are some basic questions that all of us ask. And all of us ask the concepts of, who am I? Uh, Not my name. I mean, that's not the issue. The issue is not what's your name. The issue is, I mean, who am I? And there will be people who will search for the answers to that question And they will search in some very unhealthy ways. A young lady who's never been loved, or maybe her father wasn't part of the picture, she yearns for the love of a a man in her life. And so sometimes young ladies will give themselves over to whatever young man comes along and says, I love you, when in reality is he doesn't know what love is. What he should say is, I lust after you. That's what he should say. But all she hears is, ooh, somebody wants to give me attention. Or a young man who never had the affirmation, perhaps, of a father. Maybe the father was in the home, but the father was such a hard individual that he never lived up to his father's expectations. And he carries that on into adulthood and into his marriage. And I'm telling you, there are struggles that we bring forward in the rest of our lives where we say, I don't know who I am because I never settled who I was. I was always somebody, if I got good grades or if I was playing sports... But now that I'm not playing sports and I'm not getting good grades, I don't know who I am. Or maybe it was if the boss tells me I'm valuable, then I'm valuable. See, at the end of the day, everybody asks the question, who am I? They may not verbalize it. I can tell you this, adolescents, young people, teenagers, uh, I I really do love teenagers, but teenagers, y'all are weird. Let's just be real. Let's lay it out there, okay? We were there. We were weird, right? When Dr. Evil Pituitary Gland kicks in, there's some weird stuff that happens, okay? Let's just leave it on the table. But here's what I know. In your age especially, you are on a venture, a journey for your identity. Les Paird, an a adolescent psychologist, he would say there are actually seven areas where young people will search for their identity. They will search for their identity, sometimes in behaving like they think older people behave. So therefore, you have a 13 or 14-year-old kid that starts talking like they're a 30, 40-year-old man. And you're like, why are you doing that? Or not talking that way, but maybe behaviors. Maybe in their mind it's like, oh, well, the adults smoke or the adults do these or the older kids who are in college, you know, vaping. You know, I just see them doing that. And so you get this 11, 12, 13-year-old kid going, well, this is what the older kids do, so that's what I want to do. And you're asking yourself, well, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they just think for themselves? Well, it's because they're mimicking what older kids do. They're mimicking what they think grown-up behavior looks like. Some people get their identity from their accomplishments. Some people get their identity from uh, idols, celebrities. Some people get their identity from whether they drive a nice truck or a sports car or they drive an old beat-up, you know, piece of junk. But the idea behind that is this. We're on a search for an identity. You look at the rest of these things. We ask the same questions. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or an atheist. What's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Why, why was I born? And people will go, well, I don't know. So then it's this adventure to go find your purpose. Well, I can tell you this, all these questions, when you talk about meaning, direction, relationships, all of those people are hungering for answers. But as we begin this weekend, I want you to understand maybe one of the most fundamental lessons I could ever deliver to you on the subject of learn to discern and deal with the morals and the values. I can tell you this, morals and values, they don't just poof, come out of thin air. Morals and values, they stem, they come forth from something. There is a root to the morals and the values that all of us profess. And I can tell you this tonight, no matter where we go tomorrow, dealing with truth, relativism, 
dealing with the church, dealing with the family, no matter where else we go, what you conclude on this subject matters. Because it will serve as a basis for you. And while tonight's lesson is not uh, this proof that God exists, that would be a great lesson. And I can tell you it would be one that would be well worth you going into and maybe uh, in the coming years of this particular event, having something dealing with apologetics where you address the existence of God and why is it more reasonable to conclude that Jesus, that God exists than that He doesn't exist? Why is it more reasonable to conclude that the tomb of Jesus really was empty and really is empty to this day? Why is it reasonable to conclude that the Bible is trustworthy? All of those would be valuable, but here's what I want you to understand. We don't have time to establish those. So I'm going to take for granted that you're going to believe those things. But what I want you to understand is this, that if you don't, or the people that you know who struggle in their direction don't have a proper view of God, then what you're going to see is behavior that falls in line with that. Let me show you what I mean. You have your Bibles. I want you to open up to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to start there real quickly. I just don't have a lot of time. Normally when I speak, I go 40 minutes. That's when my kids laugh when they're like, you're only going 30 minutes? Yeah, we'll see how that goes. And now you're looking at your clock going, well, he's only got five more minutes. Let's see how he can do that, right? So hold on. It's going to get fast. I'm going to talk really, really fast. Exodus chapter 3, you know this is Moses of the burning bush, right? And then you notice that there he was told to take off his shoes, right? Take off his sandals because where he was standing was on what? Holy ground, that's exactly right. So what he did was he, he took it off and he didn't understand why the, the, the bush was burning. So he wanted to know who it was and the burning bush identified that it was God who was speaking to him through the burning bush, right? And so then the idea was this, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, wah, 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 because I can't go let Moses, I can't go to Pharaoh because I already had to run away from Pharaoh because I saw a, a, a Hebrew kill and then I had to, you know, or I killed a Pharaoh because he was abusing the Hebrews, right? Make sure my story's correct. And the idea is this, I can't go back. And God says, no, you're going back. He says, no, I can't. Still didn't, right? Okay, I'm just making sure you're following me. But the idea is this, he couldn't go back. He wanted to make excuses, right? And why do you make excuses? He made excuses because he was afraid. That's why. And so what happens is this, after all the excuses are made, he says, no, you're going. So he goes, right? He has Aaron that goes with him. God identified who he was over in chapter 3, verse 13, where the Bible reads this, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, listen to this, What is his name? And what shall I say to them? You look at that and you say, How would they even ask that? Well, you know, there was a lot of time that passed between Joseph and Moses. There was a lot of time that had passed between them being allowed to go to the land of Goshen at the end of the book of Genesis, because there was a famine in the land, and then you turn to the book of Exodus, and now they're enslaved. There's a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. And so there's mistreatment of God's people, and Moses says, these people may ask me who you are. I want you just to contemplate that for a moment. How do you go from, we trust God's leading us and taking care of us and providing for us, to what if I don't even know your name? And I will offer this to you, young people. The idea of, of a change in culture, because that's what we're talking about, a change in the culture of the Hebrew people. Change can happen very quickly. Generations come along and introduce things. And I would say this, they don't necessarily introduce everything that we'll see. And that, we're going to address that, I think, in one of these questions. But the generations build off of one another, and finally there starts to be fruit and, 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 and evidence that something was off. So here's the deal. I want you to understand that, that if you forget God, then that can change everything. And it wasn't just that they forgot God. I think it's quite interesting when you start seeing what one concludes about God, it plays into their actions and their behaviors. Over in Exodus chapter 5, I, this is where Moses and Aaron come to Pharaoh, and, and they're going to say, hey, let the people go. Look at chapter 5, verse 1, where the Bible reads, And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. That's what Moses and Aaron said to Pharaoh. Let the people of God go. Look at verse 2. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Now, what you'll discover, time will not allow me to go through this, if you read the account going through the, uh, the ten plagues, 
going through uh, Israel being able to be released, going through the Egyptian army, drowning in the Red Sea, what you will discover is that this concept of what if they don't know you from Exodus chapter 3, Pharaoh saying, I don't know the Lord, why should I obey His voice? Exodus chapter 5. If you read that entire account till the Egyptian army drowns in the Red Sea, you will see over and over again that it actually is about God making Himself known. Because He will bring that to light, even up until the point, and including the point of the Egyptian army drowning in the Red Sea, the Egyptians would proclaim, now we know. We know who that God is. And the Israelites, the Hebrews, seeing that event occur and being rescued, they would say, now we know. I would offer this to you. This is foundational. This is fundamental. Jesus would even say that in John chapter 17, that this is eternal life, that they know you. This is not just another thing. This is the thing that is the root. That's why I tell you, whatever you conclude on this particular subject, it really does, it, it will play into every other aspect of your values, your morals, and thus your actions. Look over, if you will, Romans chapter 1. I want to show you this because i got to establish this point, right? And then I'm going to fly through a few slides, okay? I want you to see this. Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18 and following. This is a pas- pa- passage of Scripture that oftentimes we'll turn to uh, in studying the concept uh, of homosexuality, of idolatry. Uh, we'll do a lot, you know, study this passage from a lot. And, of course, Romans chapter 1, when you really read it out, Paul's writing and speaking here to the Gentiles, Uh, But then in chapter 2, he's speaking to the Jews. Chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So there really is building up. Gentiles, you're without excuse, he will say. Chapter 2, Jews, you're without excuse. Ultimately, chapter 3, all of us are without excuse. Right? That's the, the progression of the book of Romans is beautiful in the way the Spirit would inspire the Apostle Paul to write. But in chapter 1, verses 18 and following, the Bible reads this way. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, this is what God has made known. His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. If you're doing some cross-referencing, you look over at chapter 2, verse 1. He says this to the Jews, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. So he's dealing with excuses. Verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts. That's why they ended up where they ended up. It was because the way they responded to this question. And I think it's interesting that the Bible clearly says even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as such. This evening, I want you to understand the foundation of this whole seminar begins with what you conclude about God will truly drive your morals and your values. And what your morals and your values are will drive your actions. That's the way this game works. That's the way this scenario works. That's the way the equation works. A plus B equals C. I mean, that's it. So that's why it's important for you and I to understand that we are seeing quite a change in America when it comes to the current state of affairs dealing with where are we at in America with moral issues. And we're going to talk about some of those along the way, but I do want to point something out to you, and maybe these aren't the moral issues that you're thinking of, but they're definitely included in there, and it serves as a basis for a very quick illustration. George Barna, in his book, Dealing with Generation Z, which are young people who are in college and in high school today, uh, there is a new generation that has come about that is called Generation Alpha, Uh, And it really doesn't have a lot of of concrete blocks and measurements to it. But Gen Z, uh, as George Barna would would bring to light, has had quite a few changes uh, and exhibiting changes in ways that uh, previous generations showed signs of exhibiting but didn't accomplish it to this extent, such as this one. When asked the question, lying is morally wrong, is lying morally wrong? 
In the days of the elders, and of course the elders would be the generation that would be the oldest generation alive today, typically. They are the baby boomers' parents, just so you know. Some of you young people, you're like, baby boomers, I don't understand that. All right, after World War II, there was a group of people that came back. They had a whole lot of babies. They called it baby boom, right? So the elders would have been the World War II generation, the, the, the adults, right? So not many left. But when asked, is lying morally wrong? 61% of the elders said yes, it is morally wrong, compared to 34% of those in Generation Z. When asked, is abortion wrong? I thought this was sad, and of course this was before the most recent ruling uh, with the Supreme Court. 30% of the elders said that it was morally wrong. I just have a hard time believing that's not higher. Although you think about everything that's happened with Roe v. Wade, you think about all the issues, the back alley issues with abortion. There's probably been some softening on that subject over the years. But uh, it came down to less than 33% of Generation Z said abortion is morally wrong. Less than one out of every three. When it came down to the issue of marriage should be a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman, only 38% of Gen Z said that is correct. When it came to the issue of sex before marriage, is it morally wrong? Only one out of every five teenagers and college students say that it is morally wrong today. When it comes to the issue of homosexual behavior being morally wrong, roughly the same, only one out of every five young people today say that that's wrong. Now we're going to look at uh, tomorrow another aspect of this whole concept, and part of that is due to worldview. We're going to talk about worldview tomorrow, uh, and we're going to talk about the impact of worldview and what your worldview is and what are the variations of worldview. But tonight I want you to understand this. We are seeing a growing change in America, of the belief in God. Now, that's quite interesting because we still have the majority of Americans who believe in God. But it doesn't mean that when you say to somebody, do you believe in God, that they say, yes, you're not necessarily talking about the same God. You need to know that. If you were to knock on somebody's door and say, hey, do you believe in God? Or go to your school and the next person over in your classes or maybe a teacher, I believe in God, a co-worker, I believe in God. You need to understand that doesn't mean they believe in the same God that you believe in. You say, what do you, what do you mean that doesn't mean that? They believe in the God who's you know, tied with Jesus, and I would offer to you, well, they may say that, but we're seeing a growing change in the way people define that God. You see this particular study, and it's actually a little older, but it did come out. It came out in 18, 2018. It's to, the point, to the point that is made when Americans say they believe in God, what do they mean? Nine in ten Americans believe in a higher power, but that doesn't mean they believe in the God that you're describing or the God of the New Testament. You see here it says one-third of U.S. adults believe in a higher power of some kind, but not in God as described in the Bible. So the basic question is this. Do you believe in God or not? Eighty percent would say yes. Nineteen percent would say no. That at the outset sounds great. Eight out of ten say yes. That sounds like we only have 20 percent that are outright atheists that are saying no. But I would offer to you that those 20%, that 19, that they're not necessarily true militant atheists. Because what you'll see is that 19% is broken down into two categories where 10% say, I don't even believe in a higher power, but 9% say, I do believe in some higher power or spiritual force. They're not necessarily going to identify that as God like you would, but they'll say, I believe something else is out there. 9%. Of the 80%, you see there, 56% say, I believe in the God of the Bible. That's like one out of every two. Now, where that doesn't necessarily measure up, and this is what I get to do from time to time, when you live in a culture that we are just under 70% who profess to be Christians, just under 70%. When I started looking at this culture stuff back in 2008, 2009, we were at 78% of Americans profess to be Christians. That has changed in the 14-year period that I've been watching culture. It's changed. Now we're under 70% in America. And I will tell you this. If trends are anything, you need to know and I need to know America is not far away from less than one out of every two believing in the God of the Bible. We're not too many generations away. I would even give it at this stage in the game one generation, maybe two generations away and you're going to find where the majority of the people in America do not believe in God. You remember what I said at the outset of this lesson. What you conclude about your belief in God plays into your morals and your values. Your morals and your values dictate your behaviors. 
They, they're the true evidence of what your behaviors are. So a young person who says, well, that's just not me. And I would offer to you, oh, no, 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 that is you. That's not the you you want to be, but that is you. You're like, no, I'm not. I'm not a liar. I, I, that's not what I am. Or I'm not an angry person. I'm like, no, no, no. That's the fruit. That's you. That's just not what you want to be. So you're conflicted in your reality not measuring up to your ideal self. That leads to problems, just so you know. And I, I don't believe it's any accident that we're seeing an increased amount of problems in America with like anxiety, depression. There's a lot of things going on there, and there's a, we could flush some of that out at another time or maybe during this weekend. I don't know uh, of reasons why that might be the case. But either way, what I want you to understand is out of that 80%, 56% believe in God, 23% though believe in some other higher power or spiritual force. Here's the significance of this lesson. You'll see that 9% combined with the 23%, and what you'll find is roughly one out of every three, they believe in something, but they're not going to call it the God of the Bible. Now, you may look at that and you say, well, Joe, that still tells me that the majority of, of Americans believe in the God of the Bible. Well, and I would also offer to you this, that of those who believe in the God of the Bible, it doesn't mean they conclude the same things you conclude. And I'm not talking about on issues such as worship style. I'm not talking about on issues such as, uh, you know, even heaven. Most people in America believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. Uh, it's quite interesting. If you were to ask the majority of the people in America, do you believe you're going to heaven when you die? It doesn't matter their religious affiliation. They're going to tell you yes. Why is that? It's because a lack of wisdom coming from God and a wisdom that's rooted in mankind and our own logic. And so here's the deal. In the U.S., belief in deity is common even amongst religiously unaffiliated. And I thought it was quite interesting because the religiously unaffiliated are the group that are called the nuns not the ones who walk around in the black and white suits, but the N-O-N-E-S, those who have no religious affiliation. Indeed, nearly three-quarters of religious nuns believe in a higher power of some kind. That's why when we look at the growing change of the landscape in America, George Barna would show you the same thing that's happening in all the other studies, that one of the largest groups that we have in America are those who profess no religious affiliation. Now, what you're going to find also is this, that of that particular group, you're seeing a change. The younger the generations are, the higher the rate of claiming no religious affiliation or the higher the rate of claiming atheist or agnostic. An atheist, young people, are the ones who outright say God doesn't exist. An agnostic is someone who says, I don't know if God exists or not. Okay. So what we're seeing, though, is a continual change in that. That's why I tell you it shouldn't surprise us if we are seeing a decrease and a change in a belief of God of the Bible, then it would make sense that morals and values in America are changing, and it would make sense that actions in America are following the change of the morals and the values. Now, the reality is this. The religious nuns, they are a big deal now. It's not just, well, you know, in, in voting, as long as you got the Catholic vote or you got the evangelical vote, then you are going to really do a lot. Anymore, there's a segment of the population that you and I are going to see become bigger players. And that are individuals. Sometimes they claim to believe in a higher power. Sometimes they claim to be atheists. Sometimes they might even claim to believe in God. But I don't want, I don't want the church. I don't want organized religion is the way they say that. So I show you statistics that simply say this. In America, the religious nuns now rival those of Protestant religions. Uh, they also rival the Catholics. That's a big deal. Young people, you probably don't recognize how big of a deal that is unless you understood the dominance of those two particular categories in American history uh, tracing back probably to the founding of America. When you really start talking about the major beliefs that came out of Spain... I mean, after all, Catholicism is huge in Spain. You think about the, the Catholic missionaries who would go set up missions in California and go set up missions to try to evangelize. I mean, there was a concerted effort of these two groups. And then you think about the pilgrims who came over to, to try to escape the religious tyranny and to start over uh, of their own practice and their beliefs. And you're sitting here going, okay, I can see how those two might have spread quickly and been dominant in American history. And now I'm telling you today that 
even from what America was founded on and the groups that were very prominent at one time, now there's this idea of, I just don't want anything to do with religion. I might want God, but I don't want the church. I don't want religion. And you and I sit here and we ask ourselves, how is it that you can conclude that I want a relationship with God, but I don't want a relationship with His people? I want a relationship with God... But I don't want to worship Him in a setting on Sundays or even some in a denomination world on Saturdays. How do we get to a point of believing you can have a relationship with God on your own terms versus having a relationship with God solely on His terms? And the answer to that is this. We've changed what we believe about God. And as we have, we are seeing a great change. Now, I ask this question, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up and, and start our question and answer period. My question is this. Why are we seeing such a growth in this area? And here are the reasons that are given for the growth of religious nuns and the lack of affiliation. Number one, it's because they question the religious teaching. Sixty percent of them said, this is why I no longer want religion. I just want God. Or maybe I'm done with God. I don't even want Him anyway. So a questioning of their religious teachings. In other words, I know that this is what I've heard all my life. I just... And the reality is there was a book that was written um, called Already Gone. Uh, it was published a number of years ago. But when the authors of that book and their studies, what they discovered was this. Religious nuns don't become religious nuns when they go to college. Their statement and their conclusions from that book, religious nuns begin the journey of becoming a religious nun in about middle school. When they start doubting whether or not the Bible is accurate, they start doubting whether or not the flood was a global flood, they start doubting whether or not God really created everything in six days. And when they have questions, maybe they have real questions and they want to ask those. Maybe they do ask, maybe they don't. Maybe there are adults in their life who can't answer. Maybe they're not. Maybe Google becomes their major source of research. Really, though, at the end of the day, it's like, I start detaching. Their studies would say in middle school or high school. Those are the kids that are sitting in our Bible classes, that are attending our camps, that are coming to our youth rallies on Friday nights. You're like, no, no, that's not these. And understand, when I, when I do seminars, I don't talk to us and about us. I talk about everybody else, okay? So you can be easy. I know you're perfect. I know you're good. I'm just saying that that's really the situation going on. Opposition to the position taken by churches on social and political issues. In other words, more and more young people are becoming more social justice driven. Uh, they want to know what values, what positions the particular religious group has. And if they don't align with what I've already concluded I want to be, or what my college professor has told me, or what my high school teacher has told me, or perhaps what my friends say, then I don't want anything to do with the religion. Now here's the difference that should happen. I should not allow all these other people to shape my values and my morals. I should allow the Word of God to shape my values and my morals. But in order to do that, I actually may have to go against some people that I care about and that I respect. And how can I... See, our culture's done this. How can I stand in opposition to your conclusion and yet still make you understand I love you? Our society has said this. Nope. You're either Republican or you're Democrat. That's where you're at. You're either on this side or you're on that side. You either believe this about abortion or that about abortion. You either believe this about sexual identity or you believe that about sexual identity. But you can't be for me and disagree with me. That's what our culture says. And that has taken its root even when it comes to religious belief. I'll show you these in advance because I know we need to hurry. Dislike religious organizations. Don't believe in God. And then that last one I think is really kind of, it hurts. Obviously don't believe in God hurts. But the idea is this, they no longer consider religion to be relevant. And of course, my question is this, what's the basis of relevancy? How do you reach a conclusion that something is relevant? And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's going to be this, what impact does it have in my life on a regular basis? And I, I say this sincerely, and young people, I need you to hear me. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are being watched more than we're being listened to. If you don't show that your relationship with God is significant in your life, why would your friends who aren't Christians believe that they need a relationship with that God? If, the, if you don't show that God's relevant, why would they? And so to some extent, the religious nuns are a, a product of 
what we've helped develop in America. And I say we, possibly we as followers of Jesus, that maybe we need to look in the mirror more than we need to be pointing the finger looking out at everybody else. You see, the state of affairs, and we're going to go ahead and stop it there. I know there's other slides, but we're going to stop it there because I know we've got a bunch of questions I want to get to. But I want you to know something. This is the foundation of where we're going this week. This is why what you conclude about God is so important. And like I said, there would be other lessons, other series that would do well with apologetics that would really ingrain these. As a matter of fact, um, I believe when I was a local youth and family minister, every year I wanted to hit apologetics. Every year I wanted my kids to know God exists, Jesus is real, and the tomb is empty, and the Bible is credible. Every year we would study those. And some people look at that and go, why did you spend so much time why didn't it become redundant? And my answer was this. Those kids can graduate high school without knowing everything about the Holy Spirit. But I don't want them to graduate high school not believing that God exists, Jesus is real, His tomb is empty, and the Bible is credible. Why? Because everything else they're going to learn as adults will be filtered through those three points. So yes, I believe this is so significant that it would be worth developing a whole youth rally to. Because at the end of the day, everything we're going to say in these questions we're about to talk about are all rooted in this point. So I don't want to take any more time. Let's end with a word of prayer at this point, and then you guys come on up, and we'll start the next one. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, for the safe travel of everyone, and thank you for the smiles. Thank you for the laughter. Thank you for individuals who have, have paid attention. Lord, I'm grateful for hearts that desire uh, to know you and, and to grow in that knowledge of you in their relationship. And Lord, we pray that, that we would not just identify issues in America, but that we would look internally at our own life to make sure we have our proper view of you. And if we're seeing things in our life, Lord, that don't add up, Lord, help us to have the courage to, uh, to ask the hard questions of where is this coming from? Why is this the case in my life? And if there needs to be something to change within us, Lord, please help us to, to not be so prideful that we don't repent. Help us to have soft hearts. And Lord, we do pray for our friends, our family members, perhaps who fall into the category of, of not having a solid belief in you, and, and therefore they are truly lost at sea, floating in any direction, being blown by any wind. And Lord, ultimately it's not bringing them peace. It's our prayer that they would come to know you, that they would know your Son. And Lord, if it be that you use us in that situation or just use someone, Lord, we pray that they will come to know you before it's everlasting too late. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this week, and I pray you bless our time together, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all want to come on up? We'll do it. Thank you, brother. Okay, where's the skinny chair? I need to sit in the skinny chair. No, come on. Oh, man. I came up here to hear y'all, what y'all have to say. So, so I, have to, I have to start with this. Oh, good. Good. Last week, last week before you came, one of our, our students, he'll be here tomorrow, he's playing football tonight. He said, you look just like Joe Wells, but yeah, with hair. only if you, you shave your head. So I, I took that to mean I'm the better looking. Yes, you are. I would agree with that. Thank you so much. See, they're listening. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started um, just to give you all, and I think you know um, what we're going to do here with the Q&A. And these are questions that were submitted uh, through the online registration and things. Um, and we'll get to it through as many as we can if we uh, come to a point where we think we're kind of gone through all of them, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop early. Uh, but we'll start off with a, a heavy hitter right off the bat. Uh, is sexual orientation a gift from God? Is sexual orientation a gift from God? How are we going to do this? And you'll fill in. Okay, I, when I saw that question, the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, you obviously have to identify and define terms. Uh, because oftentimes culture, culture can define terms. And when we hear the, word sec, the phrase sexual orientation, sometimes we believe that means sexual choice. 
right? What, what am I oriented towards? What am I pointed towards? Uh, and our culture has really brought that up to choice, or they will talk about it as, well, I'm not oriented the way that my gender has identified me to be oriented. I'm oriented according to the way I was supposed to be oriented, right? So you almost have uh, the biological you versus the, uh, this, is, this is the way culture talks about it. The biological you, was I born with XX chromosome or XY chromosome, right? Therefore, am I a, a, a female or am I a male? But then it's the idea of, well, what do I feel I was? What was I supposed to be, right? So I want to make sure we understand sexual orientation and not allow culture to define that. So my understanding of sexual orientation is this. You either have female chromosomes or you have male chromosomes, and if you have XX chromosomes, doctors will tell you, medical science will tell you that you have an elevation of estrogen in your body, right? You have every clear definitive marker of being female uh, that science can dictate to you, that science can reveal, right? And on the other side, XY, you have every bit of the testosterone, every marker of male uh, that is supposed to be there. So here's the deal. Uh, the idea is that God intended male and female. The book tells us in Genesis chapter 2, uh, when he identified what was not good with man, it's not good for be man to be alone, Genesis 2, 18, he created females, he created Eve uh, as a perfect helpmeet, which means like, like unto that brings into completeness or like one that brings into completeness. The idea is this, that was his answer for what wasn't good. Uh, even the idea of the punishment for Eve, her longing was going to be for her husband to rule over her, right? Anytime we ever see that sexual orientation was not based upon the idea of were you born as a male or were you born as a female is one of those references that I talked about tonight, Romans chapter 1. Uh, we'll also see it in Leviticus chapters 18 and 19. Uh, I believe it is in the idea of any variation from the male and the female being the perfect complement for one another in a sexual manner is outside of the will of God and it's outside of the creation of God. So, obviously then, based upon that, do I believe sexual orientation is a gift from God? Is that what the answer is? Yeah. Absolutely I do. I believe that that is a blessing and an answer for what was not good for man to be alone. But I'm rooting that in God, not in culture. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, along those same lines, just about a year or two ago, you know, we've all heard about, well, so-and-so says there's 30 different genders, 30 different genders or whatever like that, you know. And um, I was listening to some people discussing on that, and what they meant by that was there was 30 different preferences. Ooh, the P's are really bad on microphones for me. But there are 30 different preference, preferences. So if a man only desires a woman, that's one gender. If a man desires another man, that's another gender. If a woman desires another woman, that's a different gender, and so forth and so forth, when they're not really genders at all. Genders, like you say, are biologically determined. They're not made up or how I think or how I feel, but what are the chromosomes? That's it right there. And, um, and so I think that our culture feeds us with that, that you can be whatever gender you want. There's 30 of them. Take your pick. But, and, it, and it goes to the point, what they're talking about gender what the Bible talks about gender is not the same thing. But what we have to root our thoughts are is, is in God's Word. Yeah, well, like sexuality, um, the, the, just the term gender, I think, is one that's you know, been hijacked, uh, even maybe from the beginning. But as far as when God made them, and that's what you point out, male and female, um, God didn't make mistakes. Same with, you know, Jesus saying from the beginning, God made him uh, that way. And so, you know, we, we kind of go scientifically, but you also mentioned, like you say, um, thoughts and feel, feelings from, from moment to moment of, you know, whoever I'm interested in, or even that goes to identity. Um, culture has, has gone every which direction. But, but from the beginning, as far as how God has made us sexually and uh, as far as orientation... Uh, it is a gift from God, like yeah, so. Yeah, and this isn't a modern problem. I want, we need to make sure we, fr we, we frame this discussion correctly. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a modern issue. It's not one that we need to think, well, this generation just came up with this. Um, there was an actual individual in, in World War II uh, who, coming home from World War II, an American GI, and the name is 
slipping uh, my, my remembrance, but he actually uh, had a change due to surgery. I'm trying to be cautious of the audience, right? Um, and then he, that individual started identifying differently, started performing, uh, and actually you can go on YouTube and look that individual up. But it even started before that. One of the notes that I have uh, in one of the presentations I give on this particular issue, uh, there was an individual who was a Native American who was an ambassador to Washington, uh, D.C., named Weewa. And Weewa was, they called them two-spirit individuals. Um, and the, there are cultures that will actually, at times, raise children to fulfill certain roles within the home. Well, if there are no daughters in that home, they will typically raise a son to fulfill the cultural expectations of a daughter. Um, and they call that when that son then identifies... and. Uh, as a softer, we would say effeminate individual, um, they will say that's a two-spirited individual. So the only reason I say that is if you really want to dive into this subject, we, we've got to be cautious to say, well, this new generation, they're just the ones. And I mentioned that within my lesson. Each generation before uh, added to where we are today. And, uh, and so it really is a snowball effect more so than this is something new. Next question. What do you see as major issues for kids uh, that kids will face at school that must be resisted, untaught, or possibly retaught? Me, you, you start and I'll add. Well, I haven't had kids in school for a while. <laughs> Let me see here. Kids are going to encounter it in school that either needs to be retaught, untaught, or what? Resisted. Or, or resisted. Okay. Well, obviously, I started with the belief in God. That's going to be a huge one. Um, I do know, in my experience of working with young people, um, I interviewed a young man once who was in college at that time, but he, he grew up what I called a youth group all-star. I mean, if there was going to be a youth event, he was going to be involved in it in some way, shape, or form. He was going to be speaking uh, or leading singing or reading scripture. Uh, in Bible class, he was always asking questions, so he was engaged in Bible class. He went off to college, and so I know I'm jumping ahead to college, but the same principle can be made. And he started taking classes where they taught him that the Bible wasn't inspired any more than Shakespeare, that God wasn't necessary for any morality, so humanism is what came into play. And since you got rid of the Bible and you got rid of God, then morality is really dependent upon whatever you think or feel, right? And I do believe that that is still something that we've got to be cautious about within our, within our schools, um, an understanding that uh, right and wrong does exist, and it's rooted in God's Word, right? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We live in a culture today that for me to even say right and wrong exist mm -hmm. is very harsh language. Uh, but it's not because, I mean, here's the deal. Those of you who are listening to this right now, if you believe what I've said is wrong, then you've just made a right or wrong judgment. Right to tell me that it's wrong to say that something is right or wrong, right? Um, it is illogical. A lot of times we don't use logic to, to reach conclusions. We use thoughts and we use feelings, right? Uh, so I will say that would have to be something that would be dangerous to be untaught. My biggest deal when I work with young people is this. Young people are on a search for an identity. And everything that I've read that adolescent psychologists will come into play is behaviors, um, Trends. I mean, why is it that a young person will wear skinny jeans and they don't need to wear those? I've been told skinny jeans are out. I'm so grateful that skinny jeans are no more. Uh, I was I was going to start wearing them, and then I changed I changed my Amen. I changed my mind on that one. Um, but anyhow, why is it that certain clothing styles will be worn? Why is it that certain music will be listened to? Hairs will be cut, you know. Uh, but the idea is this: it changes, right? And so young people. I've termed that, I say I've, I don't know if I was the guy, but they're chameleons. And, and teenagers, I tell you, I love you, but it's the truth. Chameleons change their color to fit into their environment because teenagers do not want to be eaten by the predator. And that could mean being socially isolated. That could be being made fun of. Um, that could be, you know, being the, the end of all the jokes or whatever, Right. Uh, and so what happens is oftentimes young people will go that route. I, I'm a firm believer in rooting one's identity in God. So 
that's something that we've got to pay attention to at home because this, it's not going to be taught. Be You're right. So. Yeah, I agree with that. God is the key to it all. And if we're committed to that, and just like when in, you know, the apostles and all that, when persecution comes, that's our go-to, that's our fallback, that we know that there's something beyond this. But, of course, that's a whole lot for a young, young person to right. Well, I think this question might go along with what you talked about and then your lesson, but um, tolerance seems to be the highest moral virtue and judgment seems to be the worst moral sin. Um, how can Christians stand firm when their behaviors that, that are not tolerated by God? How can Christians stand firm when its behavior is not tolerated by God? You're going to have to be okay being isolated. Young people, I've got to tell you something. And I say this 100% lovingly. You not you can't be afraid to have a backbone. Um, most young people are indecisive. Most young people want to go with the flow because they don't want to be made fun of, left out, like I mentioned to you. Um, and so here's what's quite interesting. And I, I want you to hear me say this because I told you we don't really use logic to reach conclusions. Our culture doesn't use logic anymore. But I want you to really ask yourself this. If you're saying that something is wrong, and somebody, like you're saying, that is morally wrong. And somebody comes up to you and says, how dare you tell me that I am morally wrong? One of the things that I want to encourage you to say back to that, that person is this. Are you saying that it is morally wrong for me to tell you that what you're doing is morally wrong? In other words... You're telling me don't judge, but you're judging that I'm judging, and your judgment is that I'm wrong. So you're doing the very thing that you're telling me is inappropriate to do. And at the end of the day, people are going to be left going, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> but the idea is if somebody tells you it's wrong to judge, you say, oh, are you judging, that it's, are you judging me that it's wrong for me to judge? And at the end of the day, they're going to say, uh... Now, I don't say that to make fun of it. I say that because of this. Logic and rules of thought have been almost thrown out of culture. And so we have, we've had individuals who are dictating direct, the direction of the country who have made the statement, I'm not interested in facts. I only want truth. And I want you just to kind of swallow that for a second. Because for you and I to establish truth or to even believe that truth exists, somebody calls you to a court of law and they say, do you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? The idea is this. You're supposed to testify to the facts that you know them to be. And that's how you're going to testify to the truth. But our culture says, we're not interested in facts. We only want truth. And at the end of the day, you're going, okay, where does that come from then? Just kind of follow up. I, you know... If you're conscientious, if you are trying to do what's right and, you know, maybe you have a mob show up at your house, 100 people, you're going to start thinking, maybe I've done something wrong. Maybe I've gone too far. Um, and then the culture we live in, especially the social media, maybe it's not a mob of your neighbors coming around, but you could be swarmed on social media by you know, uh, seemingly a mob of 100 people or something like that, and they can come at you. And like you said, having a, having a backbone um, is difficult in the social media world too. Yeah, because it's easy just to go along with the crowd or to allow groupthink to dictate right and wrong. If groupthink dictates right and wrong, then why did Noah ever build the ark? I mean, think about that. There were only eight people on that ark. The majority group think was, Noah, you're crazy for building the ark. And Noah goes, no, God told me. God told me to build the ark because there's going to be rain and flood. And he was willing to go against, you know, the ridicule that he received. So we're not the only ones. We need to remember that. God's people have been ridiculed from the very beginning. And we need to, honestly, I say this, we need to quit feeling sorry for ourselves. we got to grow a backbone. we got to be okay standing with God. And if it's just... Me and, and eight people, you know, me and seven other people, then that's got to be okay. If it's just me and God, it's got to be okay. Yeah, I really think it's relevant when, when you compared or made that statement. I remember I heard you say that at, a, at an event a year or so ago about, I just want the facts. I don't want the, or something about facts and truth, mm -hmm. however the, the exact statement goes, but, but 
what they mean by truth is not objective truth, but that's their own personal Subject, feelings. Yeah. And you mentioned that before. You know, if it doesn't agree with what I think it should be, then it's not good. But truth is objective, and it can only be based in God, like you've been saying. And if we don't have a good grounding on God and what who he is and what he expects and morals based on that, then anything goes. And uh, that's why it's so important to get grounded in God. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So very thankful that Joe is here, and I'm glad that his wife is with him, and I'm glad he, he's got three uh, of his children with him tonight. Uh, one of the questions that we have here is, um, what do you want your kids to know before they leave home? And I, I think I got to know where you're going to go with those, with the apologetics answer. Maybe. Well, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, I don't want my kids to question God's existence, Jesus' reality, his empty tomb, or the Bible. Um, and I do go back to, as a father, my ultimate goal. And Jesus would say that this is eternal life, that they may know you. My, I do believe that. And that's not just an intellectual, you know, some facts about God. That is a, do you know him in an experienced manner, a relationship? Uh, I believe I believe that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, I, you know, I don't know how else to say that in a con concise manner. I mean, obviously, you know, I want them to know how to wash the dishes and mow the yard, but that's not what's important. What's important is, do they know God? Another question that um, I want to make sure we ask, and, and parents are here, where can parents and churches go for resources? I know you talked about apologetics uh, and other things of discerning the times uh, to stay informed and keeping kids well grounded. Yeah, well, obviously, I'm going to be biased and say, go check that table out right over there. Uh, Aaron and I, 10 years ago, founded Kyle Publications with the intent to produce resources. Actually, the initial intent was a teenage magazine. It's kind of grown into something so much more um, to produce resources to help families. Uh, our ministry is to call dads up to be what dads called them to be in the home, uh, moms up to be what God's called her to be in the home, grandmas and grandpas, you're not done. You don't get to retire on God. You don't get to retire on your responsibilities to your grandchildren. Uh, calling young people up to be who God's called them to be. So we would encourage you, obviously, to check that out. But from the standpoint of just off the top of my head, uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of Apologetics Press. Uh, they've got free materials. Um, even with us, we homeschool. Um, it works well for us. Uh, it's, it's been a blessing for them to be able to travel with us. But there are downloadable correspondence courses and some free books that you can go on there and get to utilize with your children. Um, uh, other ones that I go to, I love uh, ChristianCourier.com. I go to... Uh, you, it's the Jacksons. It was Wayne Jackson's website for a long time. Uh, I go there. Um, if I'm going to go online for like online resources for my own research, um, I look at stuff as far as for current culture. There's a website called Center for Parent and Youth Understanding, uh, CPYU, either .com or .org. It's denominational, so I say that right out of the, on the outset. But as far as keeping a finger on the pulse of culture and beliefs, uh, that is one that I go to, Center for Parent and Youth Understanding. Uh, and so those are some. Obviously, we love, you know, we're very cautious about what our kids watch, what Aaron and I watch. Uh, we use ClearPlay at home. We use VidAngel at home. We have Covenant Eyes on our devices as filters. Uh, but, you know, movie-wise, there's ScreenIt.com or is it Plugged In? PluggedIn.com, uh, which is the Focus on the Family website. Uh, I encourage everybody, look the movies up before you go see them. They'll tell you how many cuss words are there. They'll tell you if there are nudity scenes. They'll tell you if there's messages that you don't want your kids hearing. Um, so do your homework ahead of time. Those are some of the resources that we would use. So. Let's maybe come to the um, last question from, from us, and where can the church 
and this is parents too, where can we invest more focus to promote participation in, among youth and families? I mean, I, I look out and I'm so thankful for the, the people who have come tonight, but there's still plenty more room. Well, old, I, I, and I'll say this, ultimately, in every case, let me make sure I say this, try to use my words correctly. When sometimes congregations, when they call me in as kind of a, an individual to be a, an outsider looking in, you don't have any emotional attachment, you know, you don't know our sacred cows, you don't know when brother so-and-so started this, you know, um, and I'll come in and they'll say, hey, would you evaluate, uh, help us sit down with our leadership, evaluate our youth program. Or, um, you know, not long ago I was in Michigan and they said, we want you to sit down with our leadership team and kind of lead us in, in brainstorming and kind of see maybe where we are and why we are where we are. And it's not that I have all the answers. It's just I'm an outsider, right? And so when I'm allowed to come in as an outsider and I don't know the people and I don't have the emotional connections, um, sometimes I can ask questions out of ignorance and I can ask questions out of, look, if you don't like me asking this, I'm getting on an airplane and leaving. You don't ever have to have me back. That's okay. But usually what I have found out is this. The problem is not a kid problem. It's a parent problem. Uh, kids oftentimes reflect the health of their families, and they reflect the health of the congregation. So one particular group called me in, and they said, hey, we got an issue. Our kids don't want to be together. They don't want to spend time together. And so they were looking at it going, well, we got to come up with more fun things, more exciting things. We need to spend more money on them. And as I was sitting there talking to them, I was like, well, tell me about their families. Do their families want to be together? Tell me about the fellowship within the congregation. And finally, they got to a point, they're like, no, their families really don't spend time together either outside of the congregation or outside of designated fellowship meals. And I, I told them, I said, you don't have a kid problem. You have a family problem. And if you want to address that, that's going to be changing the hearts of dads, changing the hearts of moms. It's not going out and spending a bunch of money. It's um, developing a culture within your congregation beyond Sunday morning attendance. It's understanding the church is a family. And as a family, then I need you in my life, you know, and you need me in your life. And, and that you can only go so far when you're sitting in a pew looking at the back of somebody's head, and then you hurry up and walk out. So there's got to be a concerted effort to build community within a congregation, to build the family within the congregation, and I will say this, you turn the hearts of dads and moms, I mean turn their hearts to the Lord where they're on fire, you'll get the kids. That won't even be an issue. But the issue oftentimes has been an adult problem, not a kid problem. And that's a challenge for a lot of congregations is to get the family atmosphere in that congregation where just like family reunions and the families spend Christmas together and times like that, but that's the kind of feeling we need in congregations, and that's a challenge to get to that. We're, we're working on it here, but yeah. we're working on it. Well, and, and it's got to be intentional, right? Together. It's got to yeah. be intentional. Yes. Um, it can't be a, hey, we just want y'all to love each other. I mean, they, yes, yeah. of course you do. Yeah. But it's got to be, what are you doing to position each other, to position people into the lives of people, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people will use their Bible class for that manner, but it won't just be, hey, just come in here and sit at the back and look at the back of somebody's head. It will be more of a, a accountability. It will be more of a small community within that. So, uh, sometimes people will start men's ministries. And I, that doesn't mean, hey, we're going to have a men's event or have a men's Bible class. That means every week we're having a men's breakfast. We want you there. And then maybe once a, once a month on a Saturday, we're coming together and we're going to work together. Because you know what I've learned growing up, and you guys have learned this too, that if you sweat beside somebody to accomplish a task, you've just bonded with them. And if you share blood with somebody, you bond. And so the reality is, is there a benefit to all the men getting together on a Saturday, including the teenagers? Teenagers have got to be included in that. They're not a subculture. Um, and then you go to the widow lady's houses and say, hey, we're here to change bulbs. We're here to mow your yard. We're here to... And you may think that's not important because that widow lady could pay somebody. As much as I say this, it's not all about that widow lady. It's about the men, and the ladies doing the same thing. Not obviously, not in that same manner, but 
spending time together purposefully, and when you start to notice, okay, we've got a good core of six or six to ten, now let's go get one more. Let's go get John. John, you know, let's go get John, and then let's go get Sam. And then before too long, you start bringing them in one at a time, your group of six to ten is now 20. You know what I'm saying? And that happen, That doesn't happen over overnight, right? But I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people who, when I talk with them, they'll say, well, we've done all those things. We've tried all these things. And it's almost like they have a defeated mentality. And it, I just want to say to them, you know, you're like a boxer who's just gone nine rounds with the heavyweight champion, and the bell dings. Are you going to answer the bell to go one more round? Are you going to try something? Because you can't sit back and pretend like the battle's over, you know? Well, thank you. And um, I think we'll, we'll use that. That will be the last one, okay. if that's all right. Well, appreciate Joe doing this. And, of course, this is the first time we did the Friday night thing, and it's really worked out well. I do want to say we have had our past youth days have been Christian events oriented probably three of the last four. Uh, but this is good, too. We really like this. And so we appreciate you all being here. Um, I just have a few more songs, and then we'll have a closing prayer, and then that'll be it. And tomorrow morning...